Welcome everyone, good evening. Um, welcome to this uh, very exciting, in my opinion, research seminar, which is hosted by the SOAS Middle East Institute and the Center of Palestine Studies and the Center for Iranian Studies at SOAS. Uh, and I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies. My name is Dina Matar, and I also work in the Center for Global Media and Communication School of Law. So tonight it's a book launch, I think, or perhaps a reflection on a book where uh, uh, Professor uh, Hatem al Hebri will be talking about his book, Visions of Beirut. I think it was published in, in the summer. Uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, Hatem will correct me. But basically this book uh, explores how the creation and circulation of images has shaped the urban spaces and cultural imaginaries of Beirut, drawing on fieldwork and texts ranging from maps, urban plans, and aerial photographs to live television and drawn camera footage. Uh, El Hebri traces the histories of how the technologies and media infrastructure that visualize the city are used to consolidate or destabilize regimes of power. I'll let him explain what that means, uh, but uh, I think I would like to make an introduction uh, to Professor Hebri about the speaker here. He is Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies at George Mason University, where he's also affiliated with Cultural Studies and Middle East and Islamic Studies. He earned his PhD in Media Culture and Communication from uh, New York University, and previously was a faculty member at the Media Studies Program at the American University of Beirut. His book, Visions of uh, Beirut, The Urban Life of Media Infrastructures, is uh, published by Duke University uh, Press. Now, the format of the talk will be, um, Khatem will be speaking for, uh, let us say, 35 to uh, 40 minutes. Um, he's got uh, to share, he, he will be sharing a PowerPoint, and then um, I will take some questions in the chat. You could see the chat at the bottom of your Zoom page, and you could also, for those people who are joining us on Facebook, uh, you could also post your uh, questions in the chat on the side. Without further ado, Hatem, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and talk to us at SOAS. Really excited, um, particularly that I've read the book and reread the introduction recently, uh, just for its intellectual and uh, kind of critical conceptualization of infrastructures. So looking forward to what you have to say and hello, Sahla. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dina, and uh, everyone at uh, SOAS for organizing this talk. Uh, can everybody see my screen now? Okay. So I've been greatly looking forward for the chance to speak with this group in particular. Uh, my talk today will be in three parts, how I came to the idea for this book, how its theoretical and methodological framing evolved over time, and then four key takeaways organized around a discussion of four images. So I hope to convey, uh, in doing this, I hope to convey the questions and concerns that, that have animated this project and, look, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A at the end. For some people, the word Beirut conjures images of the war torn landscape of the city in the 1980s, or like other places in the Middle East, a place of danger and seemingly intractable conflict. That image, which defined mainstream US press coverage during the country's 15 year civil war from 1975 to 1990 is of course not the whole story. For others, Lebanon and Beirut were supposed to embody a different possibility, something more Western than Eastern, sort of different from, but still measured by problematic Orientalist cliches. Critiquing these binaries uh, is an ongoing and an essential task in the time of delayed revolutions, the pandemic, the Beirut port blast and myriad forms of collapse. This project, however, emerged from a slightly different set of concerns. You know, events are funny things. By the time you're aware of them, they tend to already be in motion. In December of 2006, I'd gone back to Beirut to visit family. I had already heard on the news that Hezbollah had organized a sit-in demonstration in downtown Beirut. When people think of the cliche of war-torn Beirut, they're often thinking of the condition of that specific part of the city, which was badly damaged and largely depopulated, save for those displaced by the civil war from elsewhere in the country. In the 1990s, it was turned over to the private real estate firm Solider, closely tied to Rafi Hariri, the billionaire who was prime minister 
for most of the first 15 years after the Civil War. The entire area was transformed into a home for luxury boutiques, banks, government buildings, and high-end restaurants, an unevenness that has defined the financialized and neoliberal urban planning approach to the city ever since. Martyr Square, located in the middle of the downtown district, had long served as a center for protests dating back to the Ottoman period. So part of what was so different about the Hezbollah demonstration was that it shut down the district almost entirely and kept it shut down for what turned into 18 months in protest of a government headed by a ruling bloc that uh, they accused of having betrayed the national interest because of its pro-US orientation. Hezbollah, the militia turned political party who had recently fought a war with Israel, which had declared divine victory. I hope you can hear scare quotes in my voice, uh, typically build themselves as opposed to the other bloc in an elite political structure that it was an, an essential part of. So the curious grad student that I was, I had to go see for myself what was up. What I found was a totally transformed space. What was ordinarily the most heavily policed and manicured part of the city was like a nighttime street fair. Stalls had been set up on sidewalks and in streets selling coffee, cotton candy and kebabs, party memorabilia and flags. Car traffic was diverted to go around the roads and parking lots that had been turned over to gathering spaces for people to smoke hookahs, talk politics, and just hang out. Set up at, T, at two key locations at major squares, for those who know the city, Riyadh al-Sarah and Zahid al-Shahada, were stages and projection screens. When there wasn't a musical performer or speaker, the screens would show the live stream of al Manar, the satellite news channel affiliated with the party. Pretty soon, I noticed that at certain moments, what featured on these screens was live coverage of the protest on the screen at the protest. And with a little bit of attention, I was able to figure out where the reporter and camera crew were by looking for the lights of the cameras. Okay. I was initially struck by the oddness of seeing the Mizan Abim in situ and in person, but it also left me with questions that I've pursued ever since. Seeing that social and visual form on location suggested to me a direct relationship between the circulation of images, media technology, and mobility in the spaces of the city. So what history of the relationship between those three elements might contextualize this media event and the social and political fields that made it possible? How and why do images become important to regimes of power, but also to, attempt, to attempts to contest the city? How might the conditions specific to Beirut tell us something about media infrastructure and its relationship to urban space more generally? How might attending to the contingencies of infrastructure enable a more precise understanding of the conditions of possibility of communicative practices? If the geopolitical landscape of Arab satellite television is produced by and through an increasingly multipolar world, how does the question of liveness intermingle the geopolitical and the everyday? Most importantly, what would it mean to give an account of our mediated condition that is adequate to the unevenness of the historical present? So I had ready to hand some literatures that suggested part of the answers that I thought I was pursuing. Debates in global communication and television studies around the political economy of media and broadcasting. There was the emerging, at the, at the time emerging, discussions of infrastructure understood from the perspectives of what sometimes is called the global south that had the comparative and critical approaches of visual cultural studies and media history. And of course, I was very familiar with interdisciplinary explanations of Lebanon's geopolitical uh, and domestic formations. But it soon became clear that to fit the approach to the problem and not the other way around meant journeying further afield from my home in media studies to urban studies. Doing so enabled me to reframe my perspective. How is it that the city, how is the city defined by a history of instrumentalized governmental deployments of images, of violences whose traces are everywhere in the shape of the archive. I wanted to understand images and visuality, not only in terms of light and enlightenment, those always on systems of illumination, but in terms of flickering street lamps and screens, and what and who hides in the ambiguities of the dark. By building from what Lisa Parks and Nicole Sarosielski call an, inf an infrastructural disposition, it becomes possible to grasp visual relations in the social world anew. 
the live broadcast of the protest on the screen in the city at the protest becomes part of a history of ways of seeing, of value extracted from the commodification of space and public attention in mundane and geopolitical partisan bickering. I think there's an incompleteness intrinsic to infrastructure, a spatiotemporality that requires ongoing maintenance and repair, sometimes starting before construction is even completed. To investigating mediation, that verb form of media, the spatial and temporal processes that media enable, investigating them in Beirut brings this incompleteness of infrastructure to the foreground. The contradictions of incompleteness appear in Beirut in ways that can be dramatic, mundane, or mundane in their drama. This incompleteness can be mobilized towards ends that are sometimes less obvious and more politically ambiguous. We often understand infrastructure as that which defines the duration of everyday life, the durability in need of repair. But what if we instead tried to grapple with infrastructure as an event whose contradictory temporalities and spatialities people inhabit a live relationship to. I propose that we take an infrastructural approach to media and its relationship to the city, meaning I wanna show how technological and institutional forms that condition the production and circulation of images express the social and political as much as the social and political wind up built into the urban and media landscape. This book gives an account of how a city and its infrastructure are bound up with the logics of media including communicative practices which attempt to remain hidden. This in turn prompts additional questions. How do gendered and racializing systems for the ground form the ground on which urban mobility and infrastru infrastructural operation emerge? What if we pursued the question of how public spaces and cultures are produced as intrinsically bound up with the infrastructures that they are a part of and refuse to take the projects of the, of the powerful as inescapable totalities? What mutualities and solidarities might we find by turning critique to the, the question of what else might be possible? These are some of the heady questions that I carried with me into initial field work and archival visits, and that evolved over the course of the dissertation and then the subsequent years that followed, including the, the three years that I spent at the American University of Beirut. Part of the methodological choice in this book is a situated approach to these questions to think from the ground up or from the city outwards. Doing so has allowed me to see how the particularities that I found illuminate regional and global phenomena, even as doing so dispelled any simple notion I had of cities as self-contained entities. If research is only ever as good as our research design and method, uh, then it's also true that few things are as humbling as encountering the complexities of the field or the, dizzy or the dizzying proliferations of the archive. So I adopted a mixed method, historically grounded approach spent a lot of time in archives in the city, but also interviewing urban planners, architects, GIS engineers, newspaper editors and TV newsroom directors, journalists and PR and finance professionals. I also spent a lot of time at the Lita Museum of the Resistance, which I'll talk about in a minute. I analyzed aerial photographs, maps, TV broadcasts, public debates, drone cam footage, war memorials, financial reports, political posters, and corporate film. I also spent a lot of time walking in the city in both a pointed and aimless manner, seeking to find traces of the urban past and its current services, but also perhaps more importantly, to destabilize my own habituations. I thought I had a book in three research chapters, which grew to five before settling on the four that you see here. The first two center around the use of images in the production and management of urban space. The first chapter examines mapping, aerial photography, and urban plans as media forms and governmental techniques in regimes of power from the French colonial period through the era of state-led development and post-independence to the damage assessment exercises that took place during the Civil War. The second chapter examines the proliferation and deployment of what I call images of before-after and the work that they, do, that they did in the financialization of post-war construction. A before-after image is one that contrasts a shot of damaged buildings with a, prom with a promised or actual construction. The third chapter is the most directly focused on the materiality of media infrastructure itself, centered on Hezbollah's satellite TV signal and the swirl of visual vectors that were the 2006 war. I use Al-Manar's politically tenuous place on the ground 
and in the sphere of domestic and transnational broadcasting to develop a media theory of concealment. More on that in a minute. The last chapter moves outside the geographic municipality of Beirut and to the Hezbollah Lita Museum of the Resistance to examine a space within the political orbit of, but outside the sphere of the city, where concealment becomes a tourist attraction. The book follows an arc from a focus on cartographic to televisual imaging, although the cinematic and social media are also never far behind, as are the digital technologies that came to underpin them. The first chapter on the social life of maps became more tightly defined as I worked uh, on it in its selection of archives, even as what I found in the archive proliferated the type of media objects, the locations they referred to and how I understood the relationship between them. The second chapter also shifted in focus. The more time I spent with the quarterly reports and the press coverage of the most notorious of post-war construction projects, Solidaires, uh, the more I came to see that the privatization of downtown uh, came to depend, I, I came to really appreciate the extent to which financialization depended at every step on remaking social relationships to the space through visual and affective forms. The chapter on Hezbollah also transformed as I was unable to make sense of the war and subsequent protests using the usual critical grammars of spectacle and surveillance or visibility and invisibility alone. Those registers were important, but left just outside of their purview are what I now call concealment. I also ended up with a fourth chapter on the, on the Militia Museum, a bafflingly problematic space that also demanded a critical perspective on the categories of the religious and the, sac and the secular, the sacred and the profane, as they came to define the visual formations outside the city. So let me give you four key top line takeaways and then show you how I got to them by discussing four key images. One, Beirut demonstrates how archival research into the history of the production of space can profitably limit itself to the archives that are in some sense of the space by considering maps, aerial photographs, and planning documents as part, as, the, as part of the process of successive governmental regimes, we arrive at a sense of just how partial such attempts actually are. It allows us to see a recursivity in the relationship between images and the production of infrastructure, but also how such images are in turn acted on by the spaces that they presumably depict. Two. Visual citizenship becomes central to post-conflict societies, particularly images of before, after. The key temporality is one of before construction, after construction, which is not a question of public forgetting as one of relentless affirmation of the status quo and the loss of an ability to imagine the city beyond the needs of financialization and the ruinations that it implies. Three. To make sense of the full range of what infrastructure makes possible, we need a media theory of concealment and of infrastructure as an event. Rather than thinking of infrastructure as a totality that is one with political sovereignty and knowable from its diagrams and schematics, we should instead attend to its concrete operation. Doing so allows us to consider not simply how we forget infrastructure's smooth functioning, but that in the meeting point of embodied mobility and media circulation, there is much that can remain intentionally overlooked and unseen. As my analysis of Hezbollah's use of concealment shows, this visual and inf informatic modality is already a part of state power. Four, capitalist realism has two faces, one secular and one religious that share more than they admit. Looking at the experiential design of Hezbollah's Milita Museum of the Resistance demonstrates how the multipolar future is being foreclosed, not because of inherent antagonisms of religious or populist affect with their liberal others, but because of an intercompatibility of both with neoliberal authoritarianism. Now, while I would gladly spend as much of your time as I've already, as I've already taken digging into each of these chapters, in the interest of having a better Q&A, what I'll do instead is take you through some key moments in the book's argument by discussing four images in particular. The first is a cadastral map from 1931, in this case, showing the area near the modernized port that we now call downtown. Cadastral maps are the ones used to designate the ownership of land for purposes of land and taxation. The level of detail required for generating cadastral maps 
requires the combination of aerial photography, the view from above, but also survey engineers to determine more precise measurements and delineations. They indicate how the shaping of the city followed from the colonial government's objectives of introducing a systematic uh, organization of private property, of reorganizing circulation in the city in ways that included the purposes of military control and troop movement, but also uh, the support of a centralized planning apparatus. Maps like this take a view from above, one that has played an underappreciated role in social scientific thought in the 20th century, including shaping people like, say, Henri Lefebvre. The implications of maps like this are just as contingent as, as is their production. And their application is usually, at least in, in the case in the history that I'm looking at, much less totalizing than the all at once impression that it gives. I'm showing you this map not because it shows the site of the blast to come almost 90 years earlier, but, it, but because it allows me to tell you about three things. First, it shows the location of the Yugoslav embassy. This is significant because the Russian survey engineers who were hired to carry out parts of the cadastral survey, which was never completed outside key areas of Beirut, uh, this team had previously been hired to do work supporting the formation of this and other states after World War I. It's specifically states meant to contain the conflicts of ethno-religiously mixed societies. As many scholars have shown, these conflicts are better understood to be imminent to the modern systems of power sharing than some other more durable or inevitable mentality. This team was hired by way of personal connection to Camille de Rafour, the French officer hired to manage the implementation of the cadastral system. His wife, who made the couple a tidy sum on the real estate market, was herself Russian. Their house, a very nice villa overlooking the sea on Beirut's northern coast, was torn down in 21 to make way for the high-rise luxury apartment buildings that emerged in that phase of overdevelopment. Durafour is one of the characters I encountered repeatedly in the archive, alongside other officers who had spent time in North Africa, such as Michel de Cochard, one of the key figures in post-independence urban planning. The key story is that even at the high point of empire and state-led development in the 1960s, Maps and urban plans were often left half implemented or ignored, with large sections of the country left unmapped entirely. At the same time that social processes were brought into governmental purview and rendered with increased precision on paper, the resulting political formation would double back onto the planning efforts themselves. Image two. The 1990s didn't just bring the fall of the Berlin Wall, satellite broadcasting, and the commercial internet. In Lebanon, the post-war political consensus created a power-sharing agreement between warlords turned political leaders, divvying up broadcast rights along sectarian lines and elite-aligned commercial interests, granting a renewed importance to a secretive banking sector and new avenues for external influence. The arrival of neoliberal urbanism took the shape of private real estate ventures authorized by the state to declare eminent domain, dictate urban form, and generate revenue tax-free. The largest of these was the Solid Air Project in what we now call downtown Beirut, created by Rafiq Hariri, who of course was allied with uh, Saudi and, and US interests, who had made billions as a contractor in Saudi Arabia. Solid Air does not really build many buildings itself, even though it did damage and demolish far more buildings than all 15 years of the Civil War did. Rather, Solidaire is better understood as a system for making land in rubble, legible to company ledgers, and then amenable to investment. This second step was particularly reliant on visualization, originally showing images of the space as is alongside images of the space to come, most often in architectural renderings and sketches. The before after image represents a sense of the past as a fixed entity and promises historical progress without contingency. These images of before after would eventually wash over the country, but as members of the press who worked at the time would really impress on me, the public contestation of the project was far more trenchant in its early years than we now think. Images of before after uh, were primarily useful in corporate boardrooms, the investment in PR literature, but also came to embody a whole way of seeing the space that I term a citizen investor. This way of seeing the space eventually became quite diffuse and a common sense way of feeling the city. 
The citizen investor sees and feels the spaces of the city for the, for the potential they have for capital investment, which is itself equated with public interest. One doesn't have to be a wealthy Lebanese man to see the city as a citizen investor. But while the invitation to see and feel the city in this manner eventually did circulate quite broadly, the interest that it accrues became an important part of a domestic economy premised on the reassertion of patriarchal sectarian structures of citizenship and the kafala system that it depends on. This image in particular is a lenticular print, meaning that as you move past it, the initial image melts away into a second image and after achieved and photographically indexed. It goes, it goes from a scene of uh, ruined buildings to warmly lit street cafes. But when, one, but when one walks past it in the other direction, the image reverts to a previous ruination. This unresolvable quality lends the before after image to a dystopic and morbid reading that the war will not remain just a memory or in the past, that the erasure of rubble leads to its ultimate return, and that a return to the wartime cityscape is inevitable. Destruction becomes the ultimate center of gravity for before after images, emphasizing the incompleteness to urban space and infrastructure. But the before after shot also ultimately and unwittingly signals the malleability of space, demonstrating over and over and over again that there have always been other possibilities for what has become of the city since post-war construction began. In the chapter this image is from, I discuss how concealment can be folded into or enable infrastructural function. This image is from a clip that aired on Hezbollah's Almanar TV. It dramatizes the temporary disconnection of the satellite feed following the bombing of the station by the IDF switching a concealed backup trans transponder during the 2006 war with Israel. We see here the climax of the clip where a communications engineer restores the connection, rewarding faithful audiences for not switching the channel. Hezbollah are useful to understand concealment and understanding Hezbollah is essential to any critical left politics opposed to militarist intensification, regional power interests, and interested in, in meaningful transnational solidarity. Concealment is a heterogeneous set of practices and tactics that aim to keep people, places, and things out of sight, undetected, unnoticed. If visualization brings people and spaces into the light, acts of concealment in the socio-technical systems that enable them keep them in the dark. Concealment is formed in relation to media infrastructures and systems of surveillance. To the extent that infrastructure creates conditions of possibility for mobility and circulation, concealment becomes a visual modality that remains undetected while in motion. I first picked up on concealment when I started trying to make sense of the visual culture of the 2006 war systematically. There were simply too many conditions that were unsatisfyingly explained through the critical vocabularies that explain spectacle or surveillance. The temporal nature of concealment is often defined by the unstable dynamic between spectacle and surveillance but rather than being the inverse of either, is better understood to be in it, to at least potentially in an open relationship with them. For example, a sensor or camera can be placed so as to remain concealed and, op and optimally capture sound or images for broadcast audiences. The modality of concealment can fold into itself or be folded into media forms like live broadcasts, enabling their continued function. Concealment is a modality of being overlooked, misrecognized or unseen entirely. It's often quite antagonistic to a politics of recognition. The type of concealment that I'm examining here is only secondarily a thematic feature of an image or a text, or say of an intersubjective style such as queer passing. The primary aim of concealment is to avoid detection, not the production of subjectivities. If concealment is a visual modality, it is one that is not the exclusive result of so-called visual relations. My focus here on visuality is admittedly a key analytical limitation. In practical terms, concealment often means masking the heat signatures generated passively by human bodies and equipment, or more suddenly by say like the launching of rockets, clarifying that the visual dimension is decisively intermingled with non-visual elements. Techniques such as sonic masking and soundproofing while clearly important for a fuller elaboration of concealment, are not given full treatment in my book. My discussion of concealment only gives limited treatment to digital and informatic strategies of, of anonymity encryption, 
as used, say, to secure electronic, electronic signal transmission, to shield digital activism, enable the dark web, or to evade capture by algorithmic data mining operations. I understand concealment to be the live relation of uncommunicative hiddenness to data valent processes, a time-sensitive, event-specific way of not being caught in the act. The concern with naming these practices for me is always twofold. Are we exposing the survival tactics of the precarious and vulnerable? Are we fully grasping the extent to which regimes of power already include these tactics in their arsenal? I should note that Hezbollah's imprecise weaponry in this war turned the sky in northern Israel into an uncertain hazard, even while Israel presumed the right to bomb anything and anyone in Lebanon. While the brunt of these conflicts is always primarily borne by civilians, in this case, this particularly meant people in South Lebanon. Much like the kinds of anonymity that a range of social theorists have found to be endemic to modern urban experience, digital anonymity is also a relative matter. And as located mobile media demonstrate, it's best considered as part of lived place and space. Like, like anonymity, often a matter of protecting identities, chief virtue of journalism, concealment is socially productive precisely in the manner in which it delimits the spatio-temporal dynamics of observability. And anonymity typically refers to the prevention of identification or the refusal of identity. But a state of concealment is about prevention of detection in a more immediate sense. Hiding and remaining unidentified are both a question of how a range of tactics come together and managing or limiting of social relations. As location and movement became increasingly knowable and trackable in real time, movement and hiding move below the surface of the earth. Concealment isn't the tactics, but their outcome. It isn't the masked, is it, it isn't the mask, it is the masked condition. Displaced persons or the undocumented may seek concealment, but some might the militias or state agents hunting and disappearing them. Last image. This is a photograph of the underground communications room at Hez at, in the bunker in Hezbollah's Milita Museum. The museum sits on a mountaintop in the south of the country on the site of this uh, bunker, which was used in the, in the fight with Israel. So what do concealment and the Milita Museum have to do with each other? Milita raises two points for media theory. First, the museum's architecture embodies and anticipates critical strategies of suspicion that seek to go below the surface. Some forms of critique can miss the mark when only directed at official ideology that is proudly stated. When in situations when presence and gesture are of equal importance to the content of the statement. As Milita is designed to foster an appreciation for the experience of concealment from the aerial gaze, it is crucial to intend to the embodied and sensory pedagogy of the site. The museum stages a series of inversions of the surveillance aerial gaze inviting visitors into secret underground spaces and guerrilla camouflage. This necessitates an analytical shift that can grapple with the pairing of concealment with commodified spectacle. Second, Milita demonstrates how Hezbollah is best understood not as an alternative or radical other to, but a different geopolitical camp within contemporary capitalism. Perhaps because of their self-stylization as the Islamic resistance and their involvement in geopolitical conflict against Israel, there's a temptation to consider Hezbollah and the museum as being somehow inherently opposed to, say, neoliberal economic policy or, inimical, or even inimical to its cultural forms. However, Milita shows how it's possible for a political party to make claims and military decisions on behalf of the country, be opposed to Israel and Western interests, but also be crucial to the maintenance of a status quo. I think in this case, they're better understood as the mechanism by which South Lebanon becomes more deeply integrated into contemporary capitalist uh, tourist economies. You walk past the gift shop when entering and exiting the museum. And the professional and friendly tour guides actively encourage visitors to challenge them. And they will do so in at least six or seven languages that I've heard on site. So taken all together, these images demonstrate how the incompleteness of infrastructure, the always unfinished nature of urban space, define our media landscape constituting the condition of possibility for communicative practices. As I was finishing revisions for this book in the fall of 2019, the country erupted into uh, mass demonstrations that spoke in the language of revolution. I hadn't dared to hope for 2011 in Lebanon and watched as that spark 
uh, of October 17 came to mark the gap between what could be and what the state and its bare knuckle enforcers would do, which is maintain the status quo at any expense. As I was checking final proofs for the manuscript, I watched an unprecedented collapse of the entire banking system, the global pandemic, and then a devastating blast at the port turned the country into a poster child, perhaps for the meaning of a zone of abandonment, a series of compounding collapses and crises. If, my, if this book now seems like a document of a previous moment, the before times, another periodization that comes, sense, that comes to make sense after the fact, I hope that it also perhaps shows how things can and always could be otherwise. Thanks. Thank you, Hatem. That was uh, very interesting and challenging at the same time. Um, I invite people to send their questions and to kind of discuss with Hatem uh, what uh, what uh, you know what is this uh, theory of concealment, which I'm going to ask him about now in relation, particularly to the image of from Al Manar, and that uh, you know that still image. So can you talk about where did you take, where is that image taken from? Is it a television program? Is it a, a, a one of the advertising videos? Is it one, is it a film? And how, why did you choose it in a sense? You know, can you, can you explain the story behind it? Because it, it kind of intrigued me in, in a bit, particularly seeing Al Manar's uh, signature uh, logo at the, at the top of the page. So if you could explain that and explain how, do you, how did you figure out the concealment by looking at that image in particular? So I've, I came to understand the importance of concealment not by looking at al Manar's material uh, related to the, to the 2006 war. I, I came to understand it by looking at ballistics reports. Uh, but first, let me tell you what this video is about. Um, al Manad got bombed, was bombed repeatedly during 2006, as you remember, particularly that first week of the conflict in, in July. Uh, on the 16th of July, of July, am I, I going to get the date wrong? The signal, uh, they bombed the, the main station and it, the signal temporarily went off the air. Two minutes later, they turn, it comes back on and they continue to broadcast uninterrupted from a backup satellite transponder, which had been concealed and never discovered by the IDF. Uh, that image, this, that, so that image comes from like a short like ad or clip, which dramatizes that process. You have audiences sitting at home watching Al Manar, news reports about uh, ongoing battles and Israeli bombardment. And then we see a fighter jet fly over, bomb, and it knocks it off the air. That image in particular is a still taken from the turning point in this melodramatic arc, where after the signal is disconnected and everybody's watching static at home on TV, uh, we then see the communications en engineer does the ah, and the satellite turns on and communications is restored. Concealment is about hiding in landscape, hiding people, hiding infrastructure, hiding guerrilla fighters, uh, hiding underground, hiding under tree cover. It's a visual modality that wants to be overlooked. It's potentially uh, not something that is primarily the feature of like a televisual text. It's not uh, primarily an ideological frame. It's a live relationship with uh, Mod modalities of seeing enabled by surveillance, enabled by uh, military targeting in particular. Mm -hmm. Concealment is the attempt to remain hidden from the surveillance drone. Um, now, it, that doesn't mean though that we don't have material to talk about. It inhabits a set of cultural imaginaries as in, in this clip. It comes to enable certain kinds of live broadcasting during wartime in the chapter that uh, this talk, uh, in, the, in the chapter itself, I talk about the live, uh, the strike of the INS Hanit, the Israeli warship off the coast of Beirut on live TV, which has a series of multiple concealments of Nasrallah, of the camera team, of the uh, rocket brigade, 
um, themselves enabling a kind of hiddenness while on air. Mm -hmm. The reason why concealment comes to be, I, I, can't, I first kind of really grasped what it was about by looking at ballistics reports from the 2006 war is that although Israel bombs, you know, entire neighborhoods in South Beirut, levels a number of towns, the road infrastructure and power grid, um, the vast majority of what they bomb is actually out like in fields on mountainsides and in landscape far from inhabited areas. And this is because they're trying to bomb either suspected uh, military installations or they were trying to bomb fighters doing guerrilla actions, mm. right? Who it turns out were doing most of their stuff far away from inhabited areas, not hidden amongst civilians. So concealment comes to the 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 tale that is the tale that these ballistics report tell is that concealment makes it so it's difficult to locate so-called targets of opportunity, except after the fact. Mm. Okay, and so another related question. Thank you very much for explaining that. Another related uh, question is um, the idea of concealment. You said it's not ideology, but is it a you know, is it an inten in intentional political practice? How have you looked at that? And and I kind of, I invite uh, I invite uh, people to put in their questions. Yeah. Yeah, I think concealment is best understood as a practice. Uh, it's usually one which requires quite elaborate planning. Uh, it requires a, a social systems of secrecy. It requires uh, material conditions for it to continue to, to, uh, to operate. It might not always be successful, but it aims to remain uh, undetected and unseen. It's a, a concealment is less uh, a set of ideas or a set of subjective styles, although it might delve into that arena. It's primarily about remaining hidden. Um, although, of course, it then also comes to occupy a very important place in the cultural imaginary both uh, in places like the Melita Museum, but also like it comes to play an outsized role for people who aim to do what they call, what is called counterinsurgency. Are you again right. using the term with, uh, right. with in, in a very advised way? Think of imaginaries of, uh, of that come to circulate in the American imaginary about uh, Viet Cong fighters. Uh, mm -hmm. Similar things, uh, this isn't just uh, Lebanon, right? Uh, I I can imagine you can apply it elsewhere. I've got a very interesting question from Bruce Stanley uh, in the audience. Um, might you comment on the life of books like Zabin Kiyobijan's uh, Shotwise and the one you mentioned with the before and after pictures? They circulated widely to those of us who love Beirut and sit on our shelves. How does this shape our imaginaries of Beirut, our teaching, uh, and our teaching, and how might the conflict imaginary of Beirut, Aleppo, Gaza, Mosul, et cetera, be used for increasing voice in global discourse? Thank you, Bruce, that was, that's a brilliant question. So I, I really appreciate that question. That's, that's really great. Um, the before after image that I'm talking about differs from certain kinds of before after images. There's a very common one, which, which has a different temporal relationship to destruction. There's ones which are say, see, this is what it used to be before the war, and now look at it after destruction. This is, so it's some kind of point before the, the destruction, maybe an idealized version, or however you might want to consider it. it, it captures something which is long gone, and now you have destruction. Before and after, which is the destroyed city landscape, and here's what it will be. Uh, the way it has been utilized in this, in this context that I'm talking about in Beirut is basically uh, to end dissensus, to end discourse about what type of future the city might take, how it might arrive there, what kinds of socialities, what kinds of uh, lived relationships to space might take place. The before after image in this case is really tied to let's turn the city into like a global investment opportunity which in this case implied a very particular type of urban recovery, one which was suitable to like, like this, this, the volumes and velocities of global investment, right? This precluded uh, 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 
Well, it precluded many other potential uses of the, of the city. People who lived there and had a lived uh, remembrance of the city before post-war construction recall it as like a very vibrant uh, place, um, crossroads of the, of the city, uh, one which had working class and, and middle class elements, not simply uh, the luxury uh, outdoor shopping mall that it is now. Um, they, they, the work of the before after image is precisely at the level of love for Beirut, at a affection for the space. It directs and channels it into a distinct uh, way of seeing and feeling the space. The before, the pleasure of the before after image is, isn't just a projected future to come, it's a photograph of work actually completed. And eventually the before after image, which takes many permutations, comes to, uh, it also can take the shape of just an after image which heavily contextually refers to a before, right? An after image next to uh, some other place which has not been constructed. The before after image embeds the violences of the civil war into the, the urban economy. It presumes erasure and, and remaking of the city in line with global investment. Uh, it is, it, is, it, is the, it is the problematic ideology, which I fear will spread to places like Aleppo and colleagues who, who work on Aleppo, who I've been in conversation with, have said there are some instances of this starting to, to crop up. It, it can take the shape of a backwards glance. Let's make uh, Beirut the glory of the so-called golden era of the 1960s, in which case the move to the future becomes a return to an idealized past. Um, I, I would not, the before after image is the ideology that I'm trying to critique. It's the, it is an example of the problem. Um, it increases uh, a certain kind of voice and stratifies certain kinds of lived relationships to the city. Yeah. Which are, which are awful and in need of remaking. Thank you. That's really a brilliant response. And I hope uh, Bruce is, is uh, appreciating <laughs> it. Um, I, wonder, I, I wanted to ask a question in relation to, first of all, the picture from downtown Beirut uh, and the, the, the map, uh, but also in a sense, uh, what, you know, and the notion of concealment and whether you could talk about concealment in relation to that uh, photograph, uh, much more, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, if I could use the word, simply you know much more simply uh, for us to understand but also as you were speaking I was wondering about the ways that uh, these images and productions of these images they conceal for me that's really important they conceal the camps in Beirut like the refugee camps uh, and whether you touched on that in your book at all you seem to have focused on um, particular um, you know the map and and the you know the Hezbollah and so on so and the Mlita uh, museum, but I just wondered whether you could uh, talk a little bit more uh, around whether we can use concealment as as a concept uh, to talk about uh, concealment in much more uh, precise ways of actually uh, you know kind of concealing something from the view, uh, because it contradicts the image of Beirut as moving into a, you know, into a global capitalized society uh, with, you know, wonderful people and uh, beautiful streets and shops and so on. Um, I think at, at that point, uh, if we were, so if we were to extend concealment to include like the symbolic erasure of uh, the multiple camps within Beirut, um, I, I think that moves things into a different uh, terrain. Concealment would be a, would be better applied to for the Ian fighters uh, back in the day, running cross border raids, than to uh, attempts to like re-engineer the city so as that, so that you have highways which stream right from the airport right to downtown Beirut, overlooking um, places that are some of the most marginalized in, in the country. We could then later add in a way that uh, how these spaces become very like uh, made are very erased in certain discourses but then made hyper visible to other uh, uh, to other political regimes 
um, think of how and where, uh, for example, now Syrian refugee camps in Lebanon are both made very, very visible within a very specific uh, framing, but really overlooked and erased uh, in others. Um, so I think concealment is, is best understood uh, when and where, say, Palestinian laborers run and hide from the, from the Lebanese police and security forces when working jobs that they could be arrested for because they don't have uh, rights in, in another sense, then the camps themselves being uh, concealed, uh, in, in, at least in the sense that I'm, that I'm trying to use the term. Mm -hmm. It could also, but I, could, I should also stress, it could also be the, uh, you, it, it could also be the hidden surveillance camera which is concealed, not seen by people trying to slip past it unawares that the state uses to monitor and, and police uh, people's movements through uh, the mm. city. That's an interesting uh, way of thinking about it as well, which is the surveillance cameras. But if we go back to uh, the choice of uh, the material, mm -hmm. you know, why Hezbollah, why Milita, why downtown Beirut, uh, why the maps? Um, in a sense, the process of thinking through uh, these, how, how you came to put, you, you talked about it at the beginning of your talk, but how you kind of um, uh, focus on particular things uh, and not others, and why? The, so the, the, the question around uh, why focus on al Manar in particular? Well, it, I end up there, not simply because of the anecdote that I opened the talk with and that also appears in the introduction of the book. Uh, that is how I became aware of the need to try to understand these forms of media circulation and their politics as a kind of political event with its own logic and its own uh, materiality, which I wanted to try to understand this as closely as possible. I also wanted to understand it in terms of a deeper urban history, a deeper mm -hmm. media. And, uh, a, a deeper a, a set of uh, ways in which the spaces of the city become mediated for different purposes at different points in time. This is why I have this, this whole long chapter about like the history of mapping and urban planning and so on. Mm. That sets up a kind of a historical backdrop to make sense of the remaking of the city in the post-war period, right? Like no political regime has uh, cleared as much uh, space and exerted as much control over a part of Beirut as Solidaire has. Like the, the French mandate barely has the same kind of track record in that, in that area. Mm. Uh, this, then, this then sort of sets up the, the last two chapters. The reason why I focus on Hezbollah is precisely because of their very vexed position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Western interests. They take the stakes of, inf of infrastructural operation and it dramatizes it. It, it. it appears in exaggerated form because of, I mean, you, they put this, the things that I'm talking about, about live broadcast media and concealment and infrastructure are potentially an operation around uh, BBC Four, for example. But it's just that BBC Four doesn't get bombed off the air. And so the stakes of concealment uh, becomes dramatized around al Manad in this moment in a way that helps illuminate this broader question. Right, right. Very, very interesting. You kind of understand the, you know, you, you try and think beyond what you see as well and 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 the process of concealment as a process of uh, trying to, um, what is the word I wanted to use, or trying to preserve yourself, uh, if that's the right, right way of putting it. Um, I, I also, the, the other motivation is, uh, kind of a, uh, a desire for a radical left alternative to the status quo, which, mm -hmm. uh, in, in which case we have to understand uh, Hezbollah as part of an elite system, which maintains a certain kind of political order and status quo domestically. Yeah, because you mentioned in your talk, the kind of the, the situatedness of Hezbollah in, um, in the uh, global political economy uh, and in capitalist systems. Uh, which is uh, quite understandable. I'm trying to get some more questions from uh, the audience. So just to explain, Hatem, that sometimes the, the audience uh, that comes to these events uh, are um, 
sometimes from the general public. So they, you, you, you know, they might not want to ask. They might be, they might not want to ask uh, too many questions around the the theoretical approach. Uh, but I think it, it's really important and and thinking about the up, before and after and thinking about uh, issues of concealment in relation to media theory um, are, are pretty, pretty uh, and, and also locating those in infrastructures and in the global political economy are uh, pretty, pretty important. Would you, would you think, you, you were saying that you have some friends who uh, are talking about Aleppo or thinking about Aleppo and are they thinking about it? I mean, can you, can, can, do you, do you see that you're, uh, this is a theory that you are giving us. Uh, do you see that this type of uh, theory, this theorization can be applied to other situations where uh, you had a, a very long period of uh, conflict and where uh, you might want to bring in uh, the question of who is trying to conceal what from whom? And and uh, how does that how does that present itself in in the in the in visuality rather in, than in visual cultures? Um, but yeah, I've post, got, yeah. Post, I, I hope if, if if what I'm describing is useful for people uh, elsewhere, I'm, I'm I, that that would make me very happy. Um, I, I've heard I've had I've had heard from some colleagues who work on Aleppo saying yeah, happens before after image stuff is starting to crop up as. Uh, business groups start to pitch, hey, we make Aleppo and make a lot of money from a bombed out city. Mm, mm. Uh, this, this ideology also comes to inform like Hezbollah's Wahed project in, in South Beirut after, in, in Dahi after the 2006 war. We shall make it better than it was before. Right. You remind me of uh, America is great, Trump's famous statement. But the, the, the one difference that I would say between the Wild Project and Solidaire is that uh, with Hezbollah, this was very much about uh, maintaining a social fabric. Mm. So uh, this became built into the, the, the process. Yeah, and I think that's really an important point. And uh, hopefully people have, uh, have uh, kind of uh, figured that out. Um, so a question from Francisco, how do strategic concealment efforts to prevent external attacks affect the development of impoverished territories in Lebanon? Do they hinder the contemporary production of accurate maps and the collection of reliable information for the state? Well, it's, uh, thanks for that question. Um, so the type of concealment that I'm talking about is say, let's say we're talking about the South of Lebanon. Much of South Lebanon has topo maps, the kind that say the army has, but much of it has never had like a, like a cadastral mapping done. You have a situation where even up to pretty recently, uh, somebody will inherit a piece of land and then wants to sell it. But in order to sell it, you have to bring in an official surveyor to, to, to draw up a, a more concrete map. Which, so as to say, this is exactly the parcel of land which is being sold. And so you have like this real unevenness which defines cadastral mapping, but not say military topo mapping. Mm -hmm. Now, so you have uh, the historic neglect of the South of Lebanon in economic terms, um, which has a much deeper history. And uh, there, are, there are great books which, which will help explain that, um, um, which, which we could, uh, I could refer you to. But in this case, we're talking about like, like the open secret of Hezbollah's guerrilla infrastructure in the South of the country, systems of tunnels, underground weapons caches, uh, and so on and so forth. In which case, there very well might be very accurate maps of the area, but because concealment is an operation, you don't know that what is actually there is something else. Well, you'll find out that it's there if you walk over and start walk around with a camera, and then somebody will come up and say, hey, uh, what are you taking pictures of? What are you doing here? Well, that that is uh, interesting, and you could you know you could perhaps talk about concealment in Gaza as well, uh, mm -hmm. along those lines. You know, thinking about uh, the tunnels uh, and so on. So, but I think you are talking about something much more deeper, uh, which is the concealment as a, as a necessity, 
and correct me if I'm wrong, as a necessity for uh, survival or for, you know, kind of uh, continuing to have uh, your, um, you know, followers, you continuing to have people who want to, uh, to follow you or whatever. So, but, but I think, you know, the idea of survival might be a way of thinking about it, but I'm so, sort of thinking as well uh, in terms of, you mentioned the, the BBC um, and the idea of what can be concealed in other uh, contexts, you know, where you do not have conflict, where you do not have war, where you have, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, different different ways of doing things and different entities out there. So if you could if you could reflect on that a bit, and then we've got another question come up, which is great. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, so. Concealment is the strategy of the roots of deliberately not appearing or or being deliberately overlooked to surveillance systems, evading recognition, ev evading being seen. Um, it oftentimes develops in relation to, well, there's power is looking in a certain way. And so to, to remain hidden from power means to hide in a very particular way. There's historical precedence to uh, the kinds of concealment that I'm describing specifically in the 2006 war, in even in Lebanese history, when you look to the advent of um, aerial surveillance and aerial photography, say during the Arab revolt of 25 to 27, 1925 to 1927, mm. as cameras were put on planes to try to see where our rebel encampments placed, you start to have an awareness of, oh, the view is from above, so we have to hide from a camera that's up above. Or if we, are if we think we've been detected, we have to run and hide uh, and move to a new location before they relay information back to an artillery position, which will then strike our location on the basis of a topo map, which that same plane helps generate. Right. Uh, so there are, so there, so there's, there's ever since surveillance has happened from above, there have been attempts to hide below the surface of the earth. The surface of the earth itself becomes porous. This is Gaza tunnels. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to describe this tactic or this practice without awarding a particular uh, moral or political valence to it. It's potentially ambiguous, right? This is also undercover cops. Uh, this is who are arresting people for any number of uh, transgressions. This is also uh, IDF forces potentially trying to hide. There are mutual antagonisms that become bound up in the operation of infrastructure, which require concealment for the infrastructure to continue to operate. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly find concealment in other situations, um, but I would, uh, as I, I always urge sort of a very context uh, sensitive treatment of this, of this idea, yeah. and even maybe a conjuncturally specific uh, conception. Like what is it in this particular moment that makes the stakes of visibility such as they are. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, I, I'd also say that I, I draw inspiration from uh, a range of uh, thought, indigenous thought, queer thought, which is uh, overly tired with uh, a politics of recognition, which says the key political moment is when we stand and are counted and our voices are heard, uh, or say uh, certain kinds of liberal political imaginaries, which imagine the most important part of a protest is the part where people stand in the square and get beaten by the cops for the live, for the live camera. Mm. It's also equally important to run and hide at certain times, to evade the shurta and the baltagia, to mm. know when and how to run down which alleyway so as to not be, uh, uh, so as to live to protest another day. Mm. We've got a few more questions coming up. Um, so Parvati is asking, and the reason that I read them is for the, for the audience, in terms of concealment as a strategy to contest power dynamics, why the choice of visual text, such as images or maps, as opposed to other forms of representation? Very good question, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, concealment itself is primarily non-communicative. It potential if it works, it gives it leaves nothing in evidence, potentially. The things that are left behind are secondary to concealment itself, right? Mm -hmm. 
the outcome of concealment is that something is misrecognized or, or not seen. The examples that I draw, uh, I draw to explain how this operates around a particular media infrastructure, broadcast TV, and its relationship to a range of military technologies, both of Hezbollah's militia wing and the IDF. Um, but you are absolutely right. People in sound studies uh, would immediately say, well, there are types of concealment which leave somebody undetected, but it's about sonic masking, disguising the voice. It's, mm -hmm. Or it's about uh, remaining not detected by the sound sensor, not the visual sensor. Concealment mm -hmm. need not be primarily visual, even if certain ideas about surveillance lead to the placement of cameras rather than, um, say, motion sensors. Mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the, the choice of, of uh, the visual in this case is the, uh, the bent of my book, which is uh, primarily based in visual culture studies, but a more thoroughgoing uh, treatment of concealment uh, would look at things like sound, would look at other types of uh, technologies, other types of knowledge systems. I really hope somebody says, uh, like publishes an article saying, Hatim got it only like one third right. Here's, here's what sound studies has to say. Like that would make me so happy. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point as well. Uh, another question from Bruce. My social uh, media feed is currently full uh, from friends in Lebanon of post pictures of 1920s, 30s, 50s, Beirut, remembering a particular past cosmopolitan nature of the city. How does this remembering relate to the current political crisis and nostalgia? And is there infrastructural life over generations? Good question. Yeah. It's, you know, there's there's compounding nostalgias here, right? This the, the nostalgia for uh, uh, old Beirut, right? Uh, particularly and usually this this is particularly I uh, say the the old part of the city, which is the part which existed in the 20s and 30s, or it's Beirut of glamorous 60s uh, uh, of the glamorous 1960s, which this there's a there's a way that this formed during the Lebanese civil war, particularly for people in the diaspora, right? Uh, which which wanted to remember a past state. Of course, that that golden era was primarily golden for people of a certain class position, right? And not just people of a certain class position, but also of a particular relationship to the spaces of the city, people who could and did move through the city as a space of leisure. I, I want to be very careful here though, right? Because the investments in like the remember, like the remembrance of a past sociality where life was possible. Like this is like in, in the face of like catastrophic levels of destruction during the civil war, the, the rending of the social fabric, the erasure of older modes of cohabitation, which did not reduce to the specific sectarian calculus of guerrilla combat, uh, militia combat of the civil war. Now it, it's some of those stakes get reactivated around uh, something which. So when I when I speak to people who uh, have some uh, memory before World War II, when I speak to people of say who are eighty or ninety years old, they will say what's happening or what's happened now in Lebanon is unlike anything they've ever seen. People who say the, the Civil War was, was fine. We could, we could still get our money from the bank. It was bad, but you know you had periods of calm and you could travel overseas. They say now is something totally else. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, intolerability or unlivability of the present, which is complicated by the fact that you have to still try to find a way to survive. Mm. That's, a, that's is a there point. is there infrastructural life over generations you have infrastructural decay over generations you have infrastructural uh, legacies in the shape of say how and where road and water and power circulate and the kinds of uh, political and economic relationalities that they create or recreate to have access to the conditions of life requires either independent wealth or connections of some kind. Um, and so there's a way that uh, life becomes constituted in and through infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that of course, anybody who's spent time in Beirut will tell you is that the idea that 
infrastructure is on until some kind of binary collapse that happens at some point in the future whereby we become aware of infrastructural functioning, this misses the on off continuous oscillation between partial functioning and partial collapse that is that is the everyday. Mm, that's a really interesting point. Uh, we've got a good question from Reem Zakharo. Uh, the before and after scenario brings to my mind the situation in, in Mosul and the redesign of Nuri Mosque, which had so many objections to its futuristic rendered visions. The objectors to the future project wanted to consider the before as the past, pre-destruction. Pre Was there any objection to Solidaire's vision with a vision that looked more into the pre-war? Uh, yeah, you know, after a certain point, say around 96, 97, when parts of the Solidaire project start to be delivered into completion, um, there's a kind of like a, a dying down of what used to be a very raucous, very contentious public debate about Solidaire. From its earliest days, people were really upset with it from a variety of corners and different political persuasions, not just like, uh, uh, say, uh, equality-minded urban planners, right? Although they, of course, were an important part. Architects also hated the Solidaire project, particularly in its early days. Uh, people who owned land in the area also hated what was, uh, what was being done with it. Um, the parts of the city that Solidaire themselves actually do, do work on take the form of uh, architectural preservation the part of the city that they want, that they kept exactly as is, only restored, are areas built and that resembled the architectural style of the French colonial period. This is timeless Beirut, which was restored with the kinds of preservation techniques that you typically would use on architectural ruins, right? If there's like an architectural ruin, a Roman bath that needs to be preserved, there's a kind of attention to detail which goes into it. Similar things happened in parts of Beirut. Before after image, I, I want to stress is it becomes useful to a particular like financialization scheme, right? It, they become useful to an attempt to turn post-war construction into like a real estate scam, right? Um, so yeah. there were there were many uh, objections, including to, to visions which looked at to pre-war Beirut mm -hmm. as the the template. And Parvati comes back again. Uh, this is not a question, but a, a tangential thought. It strikes me that images conceal as well as reveal in that they are selective and constructive. So in a sense, they mirror that sense of incomplete visibility. And thank you for a great talk. And we've got another one. So maybe if you could comment on that and perhaps I'll take the other one coming in. Oh yeah, and thank you. That's from uh, your answer to the previous question around uh, Solidaire. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so are images selective and constructive? Certainly, right? It's the simple act of a photograph framing itself in this direction and not here implies an entire making of the world or remaking of the world, right? But concealment is not the pointing of the camera. The concealment is when the camera takes the picture and you can't tell what's there. Or who is or who is hiding in it? Concealment is not what is what falls out of uh, awareness. The falling out of awareness is like a when, when it is a deliberate strategy of being overlooked. That is concealment. Mm. Mm. That's very interesting. But in relation to the question about uh, about the, the question of uh, uh, deliberate framing and construction. So there must be some element of human agency there, or no, or certainly, absolutely. Uh, but con but concealment is not primarily about ideological framing or a news frame or a camera frame. Right, all of these things do a great deal of work to present a particular view of the world, to assign uh, agency in the world. Who who is it? Who did what? And how can we understand this event? All of that is, is crucially important. Concealment becomes a vector along which news frames travel. Okay, yeah, so it's infrastructure. And Con this is, yeah. Con concealment is uh, 
what allows the hidden uh, new, uh, embedded camera person with the gorilla unit to not be struck by the uh, airstrike, mm. right? Mm. Now, that the camera went, might then be shooting and be uh, filming something from a particular viewpoint, which is then narrated to say, see, this is why our side or our, our version of these events is the true one and, and they're hiding things from you. We have like the, the real truth on the ground. But concealment itself, at least how I'm trying to use it, um, is, is just trying to describe this, this different dimension, this, mm -hmm. this dimension of practice. So with this in mind, thank you, Aki, you're putting reminders, several reminders to buy, uh, per purchase the book. <laughs> and it might be, it might be, you know, for those uh, audiences who ask the questions and others, uh, that this might be a, a very good way to understand uh, the, uh, the logic behind this and uh, the, the, the immense scholarship and, uh, you know, rather original uh, frame that um, Hatem has put in the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a very enjoyable read. So uh, I think you should, um, you know, if, if people are interested, read, please go and, and read it. And Sinin have got a final thing. Thanks for an insightful, an insightful analysis of the before and after image as restricting possibilities of imagination outside destruction. I'm thinking about the circulation of images following the Beirut explosion for different purposes. Do you think there could be power in the recirculation of images of destruction? Power in the recirculation of images of destruction in the port, ex in the port explosion. You know, the, one of the dominant visual tropes that I've noticed around the port explosion is not so much the before after image, although I'm, I, I do think it has, that has started to circulate in certain uh, uh, urban planning and architectural circles. Here's the current port, here's what we will turn it into. Right? Um, I, I think that what we see instead in, in after the, po the port explosion is this temporality of rewinding to either just before the moment of the explosion or to the moment of explosion and playing it on repeat. We rewind to the moment just before the explosion, and, and there's the explosion. And this happens, you'll, there's these videos which you'll find online that people have like edited together footage from like dozens of different angles and surveillance cameras and people who are filming for a, uh, their pre-wedding photos and, and all of these things rewinding to the moment of the explosion over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. The time 607 predominates. There's a temporal fixation of rewind to the exact moment of the traumatic occurrence. This is properly the structure of traumatic memory, an inability to stop remembering, right? Um, there is a potential limitation in that, in that it could potentially uh, limit our understanding of what might come after when we become so defined by the, devasta the devastating moment that happens then. I think there is power in recirculating these images though. It, to the extent that they allow for a political imaginary that can see alternatives and, and ways past the, the current crisis, mm. right? Mm. When and where it can be used to put people in jail, for example, or to mobilize sentiment for putting people in jail. Um, not that the carceral is like the limit of my political uh, aspirations, but you kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, need for accountability for many Lebanese these days. A lot of people want somebody to pay. Very, very interesting and a very interesting thought to end on. Uh, thank you so much, Hatem. Uh, I think Aki will send the recording to you. Um, and thank you everyone for, uh, for your questions. I really enjoyed this and you know, it, it kind of set me thinking about different ways of, of, of actually um, understanding what is happening and thinking of concealment as, as a way of, you know, understanding different issues that we cannot explain them. But this, is, this is a great way of, uh, of explaining it. So again, thanks a lot. Thanks and good luck for your talk tomorrow at AUB. That must be very sentimental talking about Lebanon to a Lebanese uh, audience. 
But thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time with uh, the next um, lecture seminar series, and um, especially to Hatem. And please read the book. It, it'll be it'll be good. I think I have a final comment from someone. I'll just no question, but I want to thank you for a great talk, a lot of food for thought, especially for my own research on Beirut's waste and electricity infrastructures and racialization. Oh, thank you, Alice, for that. That is brilliant. And that's exactly what we hope, uh, having such challenging uh, discussions and uh, insightful um, comments. Um, that doesn't come out of the blue, but really uh, incredible research. So thanks a lot, Hatem. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dina, and to everyone who uh, came, uh, either old friends or uh, new acquaintances. Okay, take care and good evening. Well, I don't know, it's, it's day in your end. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.